Hey guys, Sean from Living Seeds, your seed guru. So this video that we have, have uploaded is a recording of this past weekend where we had our Living Seeds training day. So um, we have two kinds of, 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 um, of interactive days on Living Seeds Farm. We have our training days, which is normally um, one of the last weekends in the month. And we just focus on a single topic uh, people are allowed to come to the farm. It's free of charge. You just pitch up on the day um, and come listen to the talk. The talks that we are doing, we notify you on our Facebook page, on our Facebook group, Facebook page, and via our newsletter as well. And then we have our large open days. We normally only have two open days a year. Um, the first open day is Heritage Day. The second open day is early, um, I think it's early February. Um, every year and that's two days it's a Saturday and a Sunday we do the same talks on both days so you can decide which day you want to attend and how many of those talks that you want to attend and that's also free so this talk that we've uploaded it covers two subjects the first subject is how to build a vegetable garden and we literally run through a process of showing you how we build vegetable gardens how we expand our gardens on Living Seeds Farm and it literally can take you 15, 20 minutes to build a vegetable garden from scratch. And then we cover succession planting. So my, and this is my interpretation of, of succession planting. A lot of people um, work succession planting as planting seeds at a specific time. I look at it completely differently. Um, and I use um, the inherent genetic ability of open pollinated seeds and the and the different varieties of plants to assist in succession planting it's a lot less work you get a lot more produce out of it so this video starts off i think it's half an hour on on um on on, on starting a vegetable garden then it's half an hour on um succession planting and the the living seed slash sean freeman interpretation of succession planting and then it ends off with a demonstration of us building a vegetable garden guys if you have any questions leave them below i will answer all of the questions for you enjoy the videos guys thank you good afternoon guys welcome to the second talk i see a lot of familiar faces and it's really really cool to see people coming back it tells me that actually maybe i'm I'm helping, which is great. So who's a first time gardener here? Who's a brand new gardener? We want to start a vegetable garden. Hello, hello. <laughs> we want to start a vegetable garden. We know nothing about vegetable gardening. Cool. Fantastic. So what's the first thing you do when you want to do something, something new? You hop onto Facebook, you hop onto YouTube, and you don't know what to do because there's so many different opinions. Am I right? Cool. So we will, today we will teach you how to make a vegetable garden like that in 15 minutes. Okay, but before we start, I'm going to run through a couple of gardening methods that I know of. Okay, the first one is aquaponics. Who's heard of aquaponics? Very cool. Have some fishes in a, in a container, feed the fish, the fish feed the plants, and you grow your plants, which is fantastic. Hydroponics. Everyone's heard of hydroponics. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not newfangled, but everybody thinks it's great. Okay, hydroponics cannot be done organically. It doesn't matter what they want to call it. Hydroganic or... Uh, no. Uh, you can't do hydroponics organically. The next one is aeroponics. Who's, who hasn't heard of aeroponics? A couple of people. Aeroponics, where you, where you grow the plant and the, and the roots are exposed to air, and you feed the roots with water either uh, uh, continuously which is very similar to hydroponics, or you do it um, on a timer. Back to Eden gardening. Who's a back to Eden practitioner here? Come guys. There we go. Fantastic. Back to Eden is a really, really great gardening method. Okay, so all of these methods that I'm going to be talking about right now, not one of them is wrong. Not one of them is bad. Well, there are a couple that are bad, but not one of them is wrong. Okay. <laughs> And it's a case of you need to decide which gardening method resonates with you, your lifestyle, and how you would like to garden. Okay? I have methods that I prefer, 
and you're probably going to go, I don't like that. And you know what? That's cool. Okay? Um, so back to Eden. It's a fantastic method. I just think it's far too much work. Okay? Um, they rely heavily on improving the soil, which I think is fantastic. Okay? The ways of planting, I think it's a little bit too, um, too much effort. I'm a lazy gardener. I am. Okay, biodynamic. Biodynamic is where you use the, the, um, the cycles of, of nature to garden, okay, which is also fantastic. Permaculture. Permaculture is um, food forests, multi-story gardens. Biodynamics and permaculture have a lot in common, which is very cool. Container gardening. So um, I think container gardening is probably one of the hardest forms of gardening, and it's the most effort okay, to get your harvest because your pots are too small, the food is limited, they dry out, they wet too much, they're too hot, they're too cold. You've got to move it. No. Okay. Conventional gardening. So conventional gardening is what we think of as gardening. Where, um, and it, it, it spans everything from 100% organic to every single poison on the shelf at the local nursery. Okay? You, you can choose your level anywhere in between. But that's where you dig the gardens, you dig the manure into the gardens, you know, it's like, it's graft, guys. Okay? Core gardening. Who's a core gardening practitioner? Who's heard of core gardening? Nobody. Core gardening is where you dig a big trench. So this is a very, very good form of gardening if you are in a water-stressed environment. You dig a, you dig a dig trench. You, big, you dig a big trench in the garden. You fill it up with organic matter, and that organic matter um, becomes a sponge which holds water, and then you plant into that garden. Double digging. Who's heard of double digging? Okay. Double digging. You take your spade, you dig your garden out, you dig your garden out to a spade's depth, you put that onto one side, you dig it out again to a spade, because you're double digging, you dig it out again, okay, you take that, you put it to the other side, the first pile you put back into the ground, the second pile you put back on top. A lot of work, eh? I promise you there are guys that are double digging fanatics. They also got six packs, but I mean, you know. <laughs> okay. Hichel Kultir. Who's heard of Hichel Kultir? Okay, Hichel Kultir, fantastic form of gardening. We've got two Hichel Kultir beds over here. Um, in, in the African climate, Hugel culture or Hichel Kultir works exceptionally well from the second year on. Okay, the reason why is that in the northern hemisphere, they've got a, a, a thick layer of snow like this, and when that snow melts, it melts into the Hichel Kultir beds. Um, for us in winter, it's bone dry. Okay, so it takes two years to get the bed going. Once it's going, guys, it, it almost can't be beat. Raised bed gardening. So raised bed gardening, that's for the guys that are um, getting on in years and they don't want to bend down too much. <laughs> Did I say that diplomatically enough? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, no one's throwing anything at me. So you want, um, your raised bed gardening is is great for people that don't want to bend, can't bend, are in wheelchairs, um, have problems with, with, um, with rabbits chewing their, their, their crops, etc. Fantastic. You can then incorporate hygelkultir into your raised bed and you, you fill the bottom with logs and life is fantastic. Keyhole gardening. Who's seen our keyhole gardens in the show garden? Keyhole gardens are fantastic. We enjoy the keyhole gardens, especially when you put a worm farm down the center. Lasagna gardening. Who's heard of lasagna gardening? Okay. Layers and layers of green, brown, green, brown. Put your compost on top and you plant into it. Also, a fantastic method of gardening. Square foot gardening. Yes? No? Can't stand it. Square foot gardening is where they say you can grow all of the food for a family of four on, on a garden the size of a doorway. Okay, I know they're lying, but this is how it's sold. Okay, and they mark the little books into square feet, and you, you have a little plan, and you plant seeds every two weeks into the, and that's far too much graft. And if you forget to plant your seed this week, you feel bad, and you go, ah, no, the system doesn't work anyway. Straw bale gardening. 
Who's heard of straw bale gardening? Straw bale gardening, also fantastic. I also think that this is a northern hemisphere thing where you have a lot of, of, um, of snow melt to actually charge the straw bale. Um, we've tried straw bale gardening over here. It was a dismal failure in the first year. Um, even though I fertilized the, the garden religiously, um, it, it just didn't work for us. The second year, with, once those straw bales broke down, it was probably the best producing potato garden we have ever It was absolutely outstanding. Okay, and that moves on to Ruth Stout gardening. Who's heard of Ruth Stout? Using straw on the soil, you plant into the straw, the roots of the plant goes into the soil, but the straw actually keep your, it, it, it keeps your, um, your crop like potatoes clean, but also it acts as a mulch on the ground, which is fantastic. If, you, if you've spent any time on um, our Facebook group, our newsletter, our, our, our YouTube channel, you will know that we talk about mulching until you get sick of it. Okay. Cool. So, and I'm pretty sure I haven't covered all of them. Someone's going to mention a gardening method that I didn't mention. Okay. And there really isn't wrong with any one of these. Okay. If, if, if a certain type of gardening is what you want to, um, want to do, go ahead and do it. Don't let someone tell you that it's wrong. Okay. I'm a firm believer in picking low hanging fruit. I'm a firm believer in doing the least amount of work for the maximum amount of returns. Okay, so we will teach you now how to make a no-dig garden. And that garden was built in 15 minutes. Okay, if you have a look at our show garden. Our show garden, I haven't measured it, but I reckon it's about a thousand square meters. Okay, that's a pretty big garden. That entire garden was established using this method. And if you want to know how effective this method is, what I'd like you to do after this talk is to go into our show garden and don't go into our beds where we've got plants growing. Go into the walkways that are covered in straw and part the straw in the walkway. Look at that soil, dig some of that soil up, feel it, smell it, taste it, whatever you'd like to do with it. Okay? The difference between the soil in the show garden and the difference between the soil in the parking lot is zero. It's the exact same soil. Okay? All we did was we did this on that. Okay? If you look at our parking lot, it's like a light, pinky, brown, doesn't look lacquer, doesn't look well improved at all. You look in our garden, our soil is black. And that garden is four years old. Okay? It is absolutely stunning. If you open up, I mean, we haven't had rain. I think we had rain last month like 30, 40 days ago. I think we had some rain. If you open up that straw and look at that soil, that soil is wet. Anywhere in that garden. Okay, choose a place. Look in the center of the gourd tunnel. The center of the gourd tunnel hasn't had water at all. Okay, I can guarantee you if you open it up, it's wet. And the reason why it's wet is there's a mulch on the soil. And the mulch protects the soil. So you look at your, at your garden and how, how you want to... Um, Look after your garden. It's exactly the same way that you want to look after your gut. We've all heard about gut health and how important gut health is. And your gut health is more important than any other form of health besides doing push-ups. Okay? <laughs> if you take any, any medication, and I'm not just talking antibiotics. Antibiotics are probably the worst medication for your gut health. But any medication that you take will destroy your gut health. Okay, the minute you destroy your gut health, what happens is you've got good bacteria and bad bacteria inside your gut. And as long as your gut is healthy, the good bacteria outcompetes the bad bacteria. Yes? The minute you kill the good bacteria, the bad bacteria go, hey guys, I'm here. Have this sickness, have this indigestion, have this form of flatulence. Same with your soil. Okay, the minute that you destroy the, your, the ecology inside the soil using chemicals, using pesticides, herbicides, any one of the killer sides, or even using conventional LAN um, salt-based fertilizers, what you are doing is you are, you are destroying the good ecology, the good ecosystem inside your soil, and what happens is the bad ecosystem takes over. So one of the questions that we had in the last talk was, do we rotate the plants 
in our, our tunnels and fields, etc. And no, we don't. We don't, we, we don't do crop rotation. We don't practice crop rotation because we don't need to. Because our soils are organic, our soils are healthy. We've grown tomatoes in this tunnel for, I think, 10 years now. Eight, eight or 10 years. Every single year we've grown tomatoes. Okay, we don't experience tomato diseases. This is the first year, and my farm manager Kennedy is behind you guys. This is the first year, and it's something that has never ever been achieved anywhere, and I've searched. Okay, we have reversed um, downy mildew. So those of you who know what downy mildew is on tomato plants, if you get downy, uh, uh, um, not downy mildew, um, sorry Kennedy, late blight, not downy mildew, late blight, okay. If you know what late blight is on a tomato crop, okay, basically you pull your entire tomato crop and you burn it because you will not be able to harvest anything off it. This year we were able to reverse late blight. And get a crop, a proper crop after late blight. Okay, no one's ever done it before. Like no one has ever done it before. Okay, and and that is it's one hundred percent to do with your soil health. Literally one hundred percent to do with your soil health. Cool. So I think, um, are there any other questions or any other? Are there any questions you guys want to ask before we move on to the next? onto the next talk, because it's two half an hour talks and then 15 minutes of building a vegetable garden, literally. Can I ask you, yes, sir. how did it get so far to get late blight? And were you not able to... Late blight is one of those diseases. It, it comes in on the wind. It comes in on... on um, it's, you can't prevent it. You can slow it down. You can't prevent it. Up until this year, um, and you can go back on, on our Facebook group if... If, if you identify late blight, there's a specific test that you do for late blight. If you identify late blight on your crop, pull your crop, throw it away. Okay. It's the first year that we were able to reverse it. We would like to see if we can do it again this year. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing to your ground to improve it all the time? How, how come it's... So, uh, we do a lot of things. We put a lot of organic matter on our soil. We, we, we rely heavily on mulching. We will mulch with... Um, with a number of things. We'll mulch with cardboard, we'll mulch with mushroom compost, we'll mulch with, with sawdust. Mulching with sawdust is very, very... Um, you need to be sure what you're doing. You, you cannot mix the sawdust into your soil. Okay, it has to stay on top of your soil. Um, we mulch with, um, with, with straw bales, and those are the main things we mulch with. We, we fertilize religiously with, with Talborn Organics. Okay, it's the only fertilizer that we use. We've got Claire and Grant from Talborn Organics here today. So if you've got questions on fertilization, those are the people to talk to. So we fertilize with Talborn Organics, and then we use something that we call ore, which we make ourselves. Activated worm effluent. It's activated worm we. You can look it up on, on YouTube. I've got a video. Plenty of people have got a, a, a video. You take worm, worm effluent or worm leachate, put it into a container, feed it molasses, hoi an airstone inside there, bubble it for 48 hours, take that, put it onto your soil. Okay, and basically you you're... That. No, we just put it on direct. Okay, you are basically super saturating your soil with soil bacteria. And you will see a response in your plants in 24 hours. The plants will change color. Okay, that's how good it is in 24 hours. Guano is fantastic if you have access to it. Yes. Oh, like um, sea grow or something like that. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's, it's a case of as long as it's an organic fertilizer, they are they all good. We have preferences. We have a a, a, um, a a long relationship and a long use of using Talborn Organics. Okay, so we are. We are a little bit biased in that sense. Children, children. If you use only compost as your mulch, using compost as your mulch is fantastic. Only with no fertilizer. As a mulch, compost, Only. yes, so compost as a mulch is fantastic, okay, it, it really is fantastic, we'll do it once a year until we run out of compost, 
We make one huge compost pile, break it down over winter, use that compost as a mulch on our plants, okay, and we, and we try and stretch it as far as possible. Compost as a mulch is fantastic. Don't dig the compost into the soil like the old-time gardeners used to do. Allow the compost to remain on top of the soil and allow the soil organisms to draw the compost into the soil. You will get the most benefit from the compost like that. Cool. Ma'am. We have chopped the Korea, the Korea tree. I don't know. Yes. We, and it smells acidy. Are we going to do something to Put it on top of your soil. Fantastic. Okay. Um, you, can, you can chip any tree, including pine trees, and put it on top of your soil as a mulch. Okay. Don't dig it into your soil. Sir? Some of us big with pots and, and homesteads. So what do you advise your warning recommendation for, 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 for plots that have both of a mix of vegetables and fruits and chickens? I'm not following you. This is a mixed plot. We've got cattle, we've got chickens, we've got fruit trees, vegetable gardens. So all of those types that you, that you, that you listed, they're all potentially available for, for your average midwall plot. What this type of, of, of gardening, yeah. these t you can do whatever you want. What, whatever resonates with you and the type of gardening that you want to do on your plot. We've got a guy, uh, one of my neighbors, he's got a big um, aquaculture um, operation. He wants to do aquaculture. That's fantastic. Okay. I personally don't think the midval is a good idea for aquaculture. Uh, the winters are too cold to keep the, um, the, uh, the fish going um, at a at an optimal level you'll you'll keep them uh, uh, survive uh, surviving uh, you might need to heat the water which is an additional escom expense um, but it's 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 a case of literally choose which one you want to do i would do whichever one resonates with you if you have access to water and you want to do aquaculture fantastic access to water want to do hydroponics fantastic i don't think hydroponics um I don't believe in hydroponics. Let me put it that way, okay? Um, but that's, it, it's a personal opinion. Um, and you, you, uh, uh, okay, a very good example. If you want to test what's better, hydroponics or growing in soil, okay? Get a tomato that you... Yes. Yes. They won't eat it, yeah. Okay. Correct. So there's a very good example. Okay, the tortoise won't eat the hydroponic lettuce. All you need to do is get. All you need to do is get a tomato that was ripened on a hydroponic plant and a tomato that was ripened grown in soil. Put them side by side on your counter. You will know within three days whether hydroponics is good or not. Cool. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It's absolutely fantastic. The only thing with horse manure is you'd have a, a, a very high weed load. Weed seed. Not, not weed. Weed seed load. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, well, there we go. Sorry. You'll have a very high weed load, man. Cool, guys. So, um, the first talk was about starting a vegetable garden and different types of gardening. The second talk is talking about succession planting. So, who wants to be on the spot and tell me what succession planting is? Go for it. Oh, no, you're not talking to me. Yes, ma'am. I'm taking tomatoes just one plant. So, you put some plants in and when you're sitting in the tank, it depends on the crop. The veggie you're planting, if you plant the next one, so that you've got a big front, you don't have everything at one time. Okay, cool. Very nice description. Succession planting is planting in a staggered method so that you have a constant flow of vegetables. Okay? And that's actually a very, very good description. Okay? Um, one of the previous people that attended the, the talk also gave me a very good description. And succession planting is planting seeds every, every so many weeks to make sure that you don't have a, a massive bounty of harvest. So... I look at succession planting completely differently because the way people explain succession planting traditionally frustrates me because it's not true. Okay. What you need to do is you need to understand the seed that you are using for succession planting, number one. And number two, you need to understand the variety of crop that you are planting. 
So let me cover the seed first. There are two main types of seed that you have access to. You have access to hybrid seed and you have access to open pollinated seed. If you are a fan of open pollinated seed, you're at the right place because living seeds only supplies open pollinated seed. There is nothing wrong with hybrid seed. Okay, we just don't supply it. Okay, the first problem with hybrid seed is that you can't save the seed. I can't take seed from a hybrid fruit, save the seed, plant it again and get the exact same fruit the following year. I'm going to get what's called um, segregation where you have, if you plant 10 seeds, you have 10 different tomato plants. Okay, they're all tomatoes, but they all grow differently. Um, the next thing is um, you have to buy the seed every single year. So if I'm a hybrid seed seller, you buy the seed from me this year, you plant it, next year you come back, and I have you as a captive customer because you're coming back every single year. Open pollinated seed, you save the seed or something that we supply you, as long as it's not cross-pollinated, you get the same variety the following year. The cool thing about hybrid seed, okay, especially if you're a commercial, and I'm going to use cabbage as the example. I've got a land, I can plant 20,000 cabbages, I'm a commercial farmer, I get my 20,000 cabbages and I, I plant all, all my seeds, I grow my seedlings, plant my seedlings into my field. And I know in 100 days time, I'm going to be harvesting 19,995 cabbages, because the five the rabbits ate. Okay. <laughs> The cool thing is, as a farmer, I send one vehicle into the field, I send one team into the field, and I send one vehicle to the market. Done. That's cool. Only one vehicle in the field means less soil damage. Um, a single harvest means less labor. Um, one trip to the market is less cost. And now I can work that field for the next crop. So as a hybrid farmer, that is what I want to plant. If I was, or as a hybrid farmer, as a commercial farmer, that's what I want to, want to plant. If I was a commercial farmer, I would only plant hybrid seed. That's it. Done. End of story. Okay? Because I want to make money. Okay? If, however, I'm a market gardener and I go to a farmer's market every single Saturday and I plant, let's say, a thousand cabbages and my thousand cabbages ripen in one week. What do I do with my thousand cabbages at the farmer's market? Five bucks a cabbage? Have we made money? Okay. So, what you do is you plant open pollinated varieties. So, if you've been into our show garden, you see that we have our cabbage beds. And they're looking a bit sparse, am I right? There's like one cabbage here and two cabbages there and four cabbages over here. And the cabbages are sparse because we planted farai. Do you remember the date of when you planted those cabbages? Sorry? 15th of March. We planted every single cabbage on that garden on the 15th of March. We've been eating cabbage for three months. Okay, so every single cabbage variety that was planted in that garden, and I think we planted something like 16 or 18 or, or 20 types of cabbage. Okay, they were all planted on the same day, but we've been eating cabbage for three months. Now, why is that? Okay, open pollinated plants have something called genetic diversity. And what, what that means is that even though the plant looks the same, it's, it's, it, it ripens from day 80 all the way through to day 100. Or it ripens from day 60 or 65 all the way to day 90. Or it ripens from day 90 all the way to day 150. Do you see what I'm talking about? So if I plant three or four different kinds of cabbage, I'm in cabbage for three months. Now, if I'm a market gardener, okay, I can take cabbage to the market every single week and charge 40 bucks a cabbage. Much better than five bucks. Okay? If you're a gardener and you plant 20 hybrid cabbages and 20 hybrid cabbages are ripe in the same week, who's going to charge 20 cabbages in a single week? You. <laughs> Will you? <laughs> it's a, a, it's a big task, okay? So you can ferment them and turn them into sauerkraut, but there's only, only so much sauerkraut you can make, okay? So you do four or five into sauerkraut, you eat one and you give the rest away, or feed them to the tortoises, or whatever the story is. It's far better that you plant four varieties and you have cabbage for three months. We will still be eating cabbage for another two or three weeks over there, 
okay? Because what we did was we used open pollinated seed number one, okay, that has a staggered ripening. For a commercial farmer, that is death. A commercial farmer cannot afford staggered ripening because what he'll do is he'll time it and say, okay, fine, um, I'm going to get 40% of my crop in this week. I'm going to harvest that and just plow the rest in. It's a waste. For a home gardener, that's what you want. So succession planting is, first of all, using the type of seed. So you can have a cabbage that ripens in 55 days, a cabbage that ripens in 70, a cabbage that ripens in 90, and a cabbage that ripens in 110 days. Okay? If you plant all of those cabbages on the same day, you will eat cabbage for four months. That is succession planting. Okay? Using the variety. The next form of succession planting is... So certain things you can't succession plant. So, like carrots or onions, you can't succession plant. Carrots have to be planted February, March. Onions have to be planted February, March. They need to have the winter. If you plant carrots now, you're not going to harvest carrots in three months' time. You're going to have nice, beautiful green leaves and little carrots like this. Okay? Because it hasn't had that cold winter vernalization to produce nice, nice carrots. Same thing, th same thing with onions. Onions won't bulb without a, a, a cold period. If there's no cold period, they're not going to bulb. So you're just going to have green salad onions. Oh, your seed is because I didn't get nice round onions. Well, did you plant them at the right time of the year? Okay. So that's the one. <laughs> Am I striking a... <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> okay, so, so that is succession planting. The next form of succession planting is, let's take three crops. Or, okay... I've done cabbages. Let's take um, beans. We have bush beans, we have pole beans, and we have runner beans. Bush beans, you get beans in 50, 55 days. Pole beans, 80 days. Runner beans, 100 days. You plant all three at the same time, you start eating bush beans off the little bushes. The minute you start harvesting um, beans off the bush beans, plant your next batch of bush beans. Okay, your pole beans take 70, 80, 85 days. The minute you start harvesting off the pole beans, you plant your next batch of pole beans. You see what I'm saying? So it's not a case of, I need to plant my seed every two weeks. And this is where people fail at succession planting. Because if life happens, okay, you get a new puppy. We have a new puppy, okay. And all of a sudden, you don't get sleep at night, and you forget to plant your seeds for two weeks. And you go, oh, you know what, oh, don't worry about it, I'm not going to plant. Okay, and you forget about it. Succession planting is using the type of seed and the type of plant to get the maximum crop. Okay, same with tomatoes. You get determinate tomatoes, bush-type tomatoes, and indeterminate tomatoes. You plant the two together, you'll be eating off the determinate... Uh, 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 You'll be eating off the determinate plants a month before the indeterminate plants. Okay? And this is the way you succession plant. Don't listen to people that tell you you must plant the seeds every two weeks. Okay? Because every two weeks or, or even every month is not going to work. Because if you plant tomato seeds every month and plant those seeds into the ground, three months' time, you're going to have tomatoes on your kitchen counter like this. And you're going to put a photograph on Facebook and say, hey guys, check my tomatoes. What do I do with these tomatoes? Yes? You only see the good stuff on Facebook, am I right? Hey? No one shows you, I spent, I spent the last three weeks processing tomatoes. Don't show me another tomato. Am I right? Yeah? Cool, guys. Okay, so that is the living seeds version of succession planting. Maybe I need to write an article one day. Guys, I think... Say again? Soon. Yes. And there's a lot of things I need to write. Cool, guys. Are there any questions about succession planting specifically? So, uh, uh, it works for the majority of plants. Plants that it won't work for are things like garlic or onions or carrots that have a very specific season that they need to grow in, okay? But, but things like, so for example, brinjals or, or eggplant, you won't succession plant eggplant, 
okay? Because it's such a long season crop that you plant your seedlings now. You only start harvesting brinjals end of December, early January, okay? And if you look after those plants, they will produce all the way through to the first frost. Especially if you feed those plants when they start flowering and, and, and after the second pick. If you feed those plants, they will carry you through all the way through to, through to winter. There's no need to succession plant them. So, same thing with chilies, yeah. Okay, there's no need to succession plant chilies. Look after the plant. It'll produce for you if you have no frost for three, four years. Okay. Yeah, so what we do is we will replace all of our super hot chili plants every three years. So we'll grow them for two years, then the third year we replace all of them. So this is a replacement year. We've replaced basically all of our super hot chili plants this year. I think we've only kept about 30 or 40 plants that we overwintering, but the rest we just replaced. And we, we replaced like, I think, five or 600 plants. Okay. Yes, sir. If you'd like a regular supply of carrots, plant. Yeah, so carrots are quite cool, okay? If you plant a lot of carrots in February, March, okay, they will grow, they'll make nice roots early, uh, early in winter, and then they will hold in the soil for the whole of winter. The colder the carrots get, the sweeter they are, okay? Which is absolutely stunning. So late winter carrots. Oh, they're abs they are the absolute best carrots. And then what you do is you go and lift all of the carrots now, chop them up, put them in the freezer, and you have carrots the whole year. Cool. Yes, ma'am. So if you made a mistake, and you, you planted carrots about three, mu three well, two months ago, and they're already coming up and everything, do you leave them that they just grow through the next winter? No. And then no. Have you lifted a couple? What size are they? Yeah, it's probably not going to, my honest opinion is it's not the right time. It's not going to be worth it. Um, if you're really lucky, you might get a harvest in three, four weeks' time. If you don't, lift them and plant something else. Okay. It's one of the things, <clears throat> and we very big on, we make mistakes all the time. Okay. It's, that's the way you learn. We make mistakes all of the time. We, we retry, we change something, we do something different. Um, our show garden, it frustrates Kennedy because I say to him, plant seedlings so the show garden looks nice. And I say, take the seedlings out and plant something new. And he goes, oh, but the crop we wasted. No, it's a show garden. It's for you guys. The garden needs to look good. Okay. And we just redo it again. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. February, March. Most of your root crops plant February, March. Okay. They're over winter. Yes, sir. Companion planting. Companion planting. Okay, so I'm not an expert on companion planting. We do not use companion planting on living seeds. Okay, um, companion planting does work. Um, you'd need to talk to somebody else. Our, our operation doesn't allow us to companion plant. How do you then naturally control pesticides? Um, okay, so we use for for pest control. We use. Uh, beneficial insects, we use pheromone lures or traps, um, and we use a variety of, of organic, um, either organic pesticides or we use um, bacteria or fungus to counteract whatever pest or disease we're looking at. There's a number of things we use and we, and we keep changing it. And we keep changing it to keep the pests guessing what we're going to do next. You know, um, but yeah, so we're doing a talk um, on, on, on Heritage Weekend. We've got a big open day, okay, uh, where we're doing, I think we're doing three talks. So we're doing three talks, same format, same three talks on both days. And one of the talks is going to be pest and disease control with an emphasis on prevention. Okay, um, if you just want to turn off. As you can see over here, what we've done, it's very simple. All we've done is we've taken cardboard, put cardboard down directly on the grass. Okay. That entire garden over there was built using this method. What happens is you put down four layers of cardboard. 
that will kill the grass and prevent the grass from growing through. Okay, it's literally as simple as that. Okay, you fill it up with compost. We're using our germination mix over here. The frame is optional. You don't have to put the frame on. We put the frame on just so that it looks nice for you guys. So all you do, you put the frame down. Make it nice and straight so it looks nice. Okay. And then you just fill it with compost. And this is where you spend your money on your vegetable garden. Okay. Those of you that want to dig the grass out and want to turn the grass and want to double dig and want to French dig or whatever you want to do, you guys are welcome to do it. Okay. This method over here, you will produce a vegetable garden in 15 minutes. Some grass will grow through. And I reckon about 1% of the grass grows through. When the grass grows through, all you do is you just grab it and pull it and the entire grass plant comes out. If you try and lift this grass out over here, it's going to be impossible. Yeah. Okay. But once it's treated like this, what happens is the compost ensures that the grass dies and it doesn't grow through your vegetable garden. Uh, sorry, not the compost, the cardboard. The cardboard is, ensures that the grass doesn't grow through your vegetable garden. The compost is where you spend your money. And it's a lot cheaper filling a, a garden like this with compost than actually uh, digging all of the soil out. And all you do, you fill it up with, with, um, with your compost, you take your seedlings, you plant your seedlings directly into the bed, give it some water and you walk away. Can you believe it? Hey? Yes, ma'am. How many? Um train so viel. Hey? Yeah, until it's full. Okay, so what I would do is I wouldn't fill it up until it's level like we're doing over here. We're going to break this down because this is a parking lot for, for me. Um, but we, we will break this garden down on Monday. Okay, um, I would heap it slightly because the soil is going to settle. Okay, yes, sir. I, I did a similar thing, but I, I did take the grass out, which is yeah. Permission, but I also took the cardboard, and then I, I just got a, a big bulk load of Calcera compost. Yes. And I planted it, but my my first sort of, and that was last year. It was a bit late, but it really, it, it really struggled to grow. I don't think it was probably not the fertilizer, but it was, it was just the compost. Did you not fertilize it? I did, but I don't. I just don't think I got it right. Yeah, it's um, yeah. Last summer was a dead loss for most people. Yeah, yeah. Don't feel bad about last summer. Last summer, everybody struggled. It was also late. It was a lot later than now. It was a bit too late. Yeah. But this is it, guys. Here's your vegetable garden. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, when you when you make your own compost at home. Yes. You've got quite an ecology going there. Yes. Bugs. Yes. Because you have predators in your compost heap as well who are going to eat your good bugs. Yes. Now, and your bad bugs. Um, okay. So, so, so when you have these shongololo type of bugs, yes. are they the shongololos or centipedes? They, they, they're very fast moving. Cent yes. Okay. So those are, those are centipedes. Okay. Yeah. Those are predators and they are good bugs. Oh, are they good? Yes, they are good. No. Okay. okay. And everyone right now is thinking of those big white grubs. Okay. So those big white grubs are not cutworm. They are not cutworms. Those are the larva of beetles. Okay. Well, it depends. So they they could be the larva, larva of the rhinoceros beetle, which doesn't eat your plants. They could be the larva of the rose beetle. Okay, they could be the larva of, of those yellow and black fruit beetles. Okay, so it could be a variety. Okay, but they won't eat your plants. They, they actually help to break down your compost. So they are good bugs, even though it doesn't look lacquer. Um, I've amount of time looking at... So, ma'am... Is 
Yeah, it's a big But I really, I, I still wouldn't remove those lava out of the out of the compost. They they actually good. They help to break the compost down. Um, I, I honestly don't think that you are going to produce a population of bad bugs in your compost. Compost is not designed that way. Compost is actually a positive aerobic um, breakdown of organic matter and the chances of you producing a crop of, 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 of pests in your compost is minimal. Okay, so okay I really... Yeah, don't overthink it. Can we add chicken manure to the compost pile? Absolutely, add chicken manure, add any manure to the compost pile. What about termites? Okay, so termites are a problem. I don't have an organic solution for termites. Okay. The, plants, the, the, best, the yeah, the best thing that you can do for termites is to water the soil. Okay? And organic matter, yeah. Not dry organic matter, but wet organic matter. Coffee grains. Coffee grains, yeah. Would you melt with a straw on top of the... Yeah, so as soon as these plants have got away, so we'll give them two or three weeks, then we'd put straw on top. Okay. You just keep putting it on top. You just keep piling it on top. Cool. Yes, sir. As much as they can. Um, six hours. People are saying five hours. Don't. Go for six hours. You want six hours of full sunlight. Anybody that says five hours, they, they're trying to sell you something. <laughs>